I hope uh, I can provide you guys with some entertainment here. I do want to say whoever designed this did a wonderful job. I love it. Uh, I love the school's new identity. Uh, I love the animation and I'm fond of that silhouette. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about my own obsessions and how obsessions become uh, work and how work becomes love and how love becomes passion and comes around again to work. If you're not passionate in what, for, with what you're doing, what's the point? Uh, and my passion has been excited by being in the design field and illustration fields and pop culture fields for many, many, many decades. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour of what has made me interested in it uh, without going into a great deal of detail. Uh, it's more of a sampler and it's going to show you where certain of my books come from. I've, I've published 200 books, co-authored, co-edited, or single authored. Uh, I work with a lot of great uh, collaborators. Without them, I couldn't do anything. And I've written, as Hank said, hundreds, maybe thousands of articles. Some of them are good. Some of them are not. Uh, this is me. Uh, it's my son's shoulder. And I think I'm the only dad that I know, at any rate, whose son gave himself a tattoo of good old dad uh, done by Christoph Niemann. That was me when I was a young kid in New York. We had to learn how to use weapons quickly. I went to a military school for a short time where I learned uh, how to be an anti-war activist. Uh, I briefly went to the School of Visual Arts as a student, but was asked to leave because I didn't go to any classes. Um, then, if, oddly enough, they asked me to come teach a couple of years later. And uh, for the last 20 years, 25 years, I've been co-chair of this MFA program. Uh, this was one of my offices at the New York Times when I was working on the op-ed page. I found it recently and I started looking back at the wonderful years I had working at the New York Times. And this is me lately, stress has gotten the better of me. And uh, even preparing for this talk has stressed me out a little bit, so you'll see that coming down portion as we go through. Uh, I started my career doing underground and uh, tabloid newspapers, cultural, uh, musical, political. Uh, I was art director of rock. I designed the logo. I'm not a great designer, by the way. Um, I was a designer for Andy Warhol's interview, which has changed radically over the years. Uh, but somebody should have stopped me from using Broadway type with Bussarama. Uh, my type choices have never been keen. Uh, and this is the New York Ace, which was an underground paper in the 1970s in New York City. And we were uh, competing against the East Village Other, which was the largest of the underground newspapers in the US. Uh, when I got my job at the New York Times, it was as art director of the op-ed page. I was 23, 24, and it was the uh, only job I ever really wanted. So I got it when I was 23, 24. I kept that particular job for about two and a half or so years. And then I became art director for almost 30 years of the New York Times Book Review. What the Book Review gave me was a chance to play with illustration and every so often to play with the format of the New York Times. As you can see, the logo Book Review uh, is radically changed by Chris Ware, the wonderful comic strip artist. He even changed the nameplate the New York Times to one that was used in the 1920s. 
And I, nobody looked over my shoulder then. Uh, and when finally the design director got copies, he said, don't ever do that again. And I did it one more time and we're still good friends. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about really is an addiction. Um, it is said that if you do have uh, uh, addictive problems, you should let them out, let people know about them. And I'm not trying to make light of addictions because addictions come in all shapes and forms and workaholism is as much of an addiction as alcoholism. Uh, but these are my addictions filling up large spaces with tons of ephemera and materials that uh, relate to graphic design, to visual communication, to propaganda, uh, to uh, textual and visual uh, manipulation and communication. So this was an apartment that I had especially made for a collection. I take some medications. I take medications that will decrease desire or decrease bad taste or reduce my longing or relieve a need to buy. Otherwise, if I missed a dose, I'd look like this. Um, and this is a film of that room that you saw a snippet of done by my son, New York Nico, who is a filmmaker who has been working tirelessly keeping businesses alive in New York during the pandemic. Every object here has some meaning to me, not so much in a personal way, but in a historical way. They represent different aspects of how capitalism and, and communism were sold to the world in the 1900s. So you'll see how this all contextualizes as I go through the, the talk. These are some more of the uh, addictions. Uh, I work a lot with design reference books and journals, as you will see. Product mascots and mini mannequins are something that has been important to me. Ads, tins, boxes, displays, all sorts of commercial ephemera, designed ephemera. Um, I took special interest in uh, Art Deco. In fact, uh, a book that I gather many of you were using in your classwork for Hank is Design 
uh, graphic style. And that's where I break down the major styles that have been associated with not just graphic design, but with furniture and fashion and art and architecture. Uh, so I collect artifacts that I can then deconstruct in some way. These were just simple advertisements for uh, various products throughout the world, but they had one thing in common. They connected to one another through typography, stylized typography, stylized illustration, uh, modernism uh, as a movement and as an idea uh, come into play commercially. And what happens is when I've done a considerable amount of research, which includes obtaining uh, materials like what you've just saw. Uh, I'll go into libraries, I'll go into uh, other institutions and I'll find documentation and I'll come up with a book. In this case, it's Euro Deco, uh, which I did with my wife, Louise Feely. We've done 15 books together. Um, I mentioned mini mannequins. They're a unique and special aspect of the commercial culture. Um, they were countertop displays. They sold everything from hardware to uh, fashions. Uh, there's one here that my wife won't even let me keep in the house. So in my office here, it's sitting on a shelf and that's the one she just couldn't abide by that. Uh, out of these forms comes a certain kind of surrealism, uh, an aspect of data. Uh, everything that became, that was avant-garde was kind of trickled and transferred and filtered into the commercial realm. And they also have their own inherent beauty, uh, an ideal beauty, perhaps a, uh, a false beauty based on the dominant American themes of their, of their era. And again, what I do is once I've got enough of a critical mass of these things, I write stories about them. The stories are often based on fact, interviews, research, uh, but I try to write history as though it were a story rather than just a pure po polemic or a pedantic uh, essay. So Counterculture, the Allure of Mini Mannequins became a book and it has a fun essay in it. Uh, jumping from three-dimensional objects to two-dimensional uh, artifacts. Type is our language, it's our lingua franca. And so very early on, I started collecting as much typography uh, as I could. Uh, the way type was sold, the way type was designed, what type meant as expression, what type meant as function. And so I have a very large collection of uh, sample and specimen sheets, which are now flooding the internet on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. People are collecting these things all over the place. Uh, I would collect them in various different forms. For me, there's a high typography, there's a low typography, and then there's a mass typography. Uh, this particular uh, scrim from a bus would represent that mass typography, letter forms that are used to convey a very practical message. One of my students did this film, which is based on a book that I did.
So that was a hundred years of uh, typography in a minute that comes basically from this book typology that I did with Louise. Uh, I believe there are two kinds of histories. There's live history and dead history. Uh, dead history is the kind that's stuck in the factual past or the mythic past, but it doesn't move, it doesn't groove, it doesn't allow you a chance to interpret or uh, use it as a basis for inspiration. Uh, what I try to do with history is make sure that students ingest it while having fun working with it. Uh, it's not to say they should copy the past, but it is to say that they can be influenced by the past. So I've done many books on aspects of vintage type and graphic design. This one uh, came out right about the time of the pandemic. Again, Louise and I did this. It's part of a two set series. And there are many different dialects of type. There are many different kinds of type. I deal mostly with Latin or Western type. Uh, I have always wanted to dive into more type designs from the Far East, the Middle East. Uh, syllabularies from Africa, from native peoples in the United States. Uh, but I've pretty much stayed with the Eurocentric uh, forms because those were what I learned most about. Uh, but I've broken them into various different uh, segments. And uh, this is the, the, the dimensional segment. Uh, type can be used in two-dimensional space, but with three-dimensional illusion. And that's what designers are called upon to do often, make illusions. And illusions are wonderful because they're playful and because you have to involve yourself in the illusion, like a trompe l'oeil. Where is that fake fly painted on, the, on a great master painting? Uh, shadow type. Uh, as I said, gives a, a boldness, it uh, creates optical illusion, it gives the sense of volume. And so after collecting many, many examples of this, we came out with a book called Shadow Type, which is a part of a four volume series uh, that includes script, slab serif and another one you'll see momentarily. And that other one has to do with stencil. Stencil is probably the oldest form of uh, Western type we know. Uh, it, it was used as display uh, going back to the early part of uh, the 19th century, if not before. Uh, this was one used as a, essentially a logo a uh, uh, brand mark, it's two color piece. You'd cut the letters, meaning you had to have great skill and you'd uh, put them together and they would create shadows, but in different colors. And here's another one. And these things have lasted over a hundred years, probably 120 years. They were created on very strong paper by uh, some very crafty people. Uh, the stencil has symbolic virtues. Uh, it represents industry. Stencil was used on, to mark boxes and sacks and all sorts of early uh, 19th century commodities. Uh, it also represented industry uh, because uh, stencils were used in industrial uh, contexts on products and the like. Uh, this is a Paul Rand piece using stencil as the logo for El Producto. And the reason was, is when El Producto was transferring its tobacco from place to place, it was put in bales and those bales were anointed with uh, black ink 
through a stencil that said El Producto. So he basically just took the 19th century version of the El Producto logo and made it 20th century. And that became stencil type the book I did with Louise. Uh, this represents another facet of my fa passion and that's magazines. I started working in magazines and newspapers. Uh, I'm still a magazine hoarder, even though they've been reduced to but a very few. Um, and one of the books that I wanted to do was to kind of chronicle all of the um, avant-garde magazines, because during the teens, the 20s, the 30s, uh, graphic design, the uh, new trends, the new fashions, and the new experiments in graphic design were conveyed to people through the designs themselves, posters and books and the like, but also through magazines that represented different uh, ideologies, uh, movements, and other ways of uh, thinking differently about graphic form. This is a magazine called Vendigen. It came from Holland. This is a Belgian magazine called Het Overzicht. And the whole piece was done as a woodcut. Uh, there were many issues of it and it was kind of like the internet of its day. Uh, people had ideas, they wrote what we would call blogs in the magazines and they went from uh, gallery to gallery, from artist to artist, and they passed on the different protocols, the different aspects of design. This is one of the early political uh, magazines that was produced, or newspapers, produced by the Dada movement, particularly John Hartfield and George Gross, it means every man his own football, which of course has a nonsense meaning and a nonsense cadence, but it's also the first time political photo montage is used in a, in a newspaper magazine. This publication was Romanian. The Romanians had an avant-garde when writing about it tomorrow, actually, not this particular one, but other things in my Daily Heller column. Uh, Romania was on the, the low end of the avant-garde spectrum in Europe during the teens and 20s but it still had one and Integral was their publication. It was put together with pieces of type uh, furniture from uh, type cases. This was a Polish avant-garde magazine, which looks very much like it could have been done yesterday. In fact, I've seen a Paul Rand piece that looks exactly like it. And the book that came out of all of this was called From Mairds to Emigre and Beyond. And it's one of my favorite of all books that I've done. Uh, I've also been a collector and out of necessity, a researcher of graphic design magazines because that's where the history is told. That's where you get not unvarnished, but original source material. All trade magazines varnished their products. You know, they were selling things. They were selling graphic design and printing materials to the trade. So one of the most uh, important of the trade magazines was Das Plakat, the, pl the, the poster. It was German, and it was uh, representative of the Friends of the Poster Group in Germany before and immediately after World War I. Dieselt uh, is another journal. This is more like a blog. Uh, it was done by a man named Empke, who was a trademark designer. And this is one of his trademarks. The whole issue is devoted to his trademarks. Uh, it's rather complex, but at the same time, very simple and direct and represents the kind of birth of the modern trademark. In Holland, as in many other countries, there were advertising trade magazines. De Reclama was the Dutch version. And every issue, they would have a cover that showed a different graphic style. Uh, in this case, I don't even know what you would call it, but it came at the period of Art Deco. 
And this one comes out of a kind of cubistic background, uh, also de Reclama, 1929. And these things are wonderful to see because they put you in the period that you're studying or I'm studying. Uh, it requires translation, but once translated, there's some interesting facts that come from these publications. This is another one called Reclama. There were a few different magazines that used the same terminology, which means advertising. But this was done in Czechoslovakia in the 1950s. So this was during the uh, Soviet and communist governments in Czechoslovakia. They didn't have a lot to sell, so they didn't have a lot to advertise. So there's a very uh, limited amount of content and the look of things try to be avant-garde, but they don't quite get there. And that became a book called 100 Classic Graphic Design Journals, uh, most of which belong to me. Uh, I've done many profiles on designers of all kinds and of all media, and I've done three or so, maybe more, biographies of uh, designers who are considered important for any number of reasons. Paul Rand is, was the first biography that I did. I, when I started out, I didn't really appreciate his work. And then one day I had a, an awakening and I saw what craft, what art, uh, what conceptual acuity was in his work. So these are just some samples from what I, I used in the book. He was an advertising art director. He was uh, a book designer, book cover designer. Um, and he was obviously a corporate art director who created logos and what was then called corporate identity and now called branding. Uh, for Westinghouse and IBM, et cetera. Uh, this was part of an ad campaign that he would do every week. There would be, or sometimes every day, there would be a advertisement for an El Producto cigar using his drawing and the cigar as uh, the motif. This is one of his book covers um, for vintage books. And it makes use of collage and type and handwriting. He wasn't a calligrapher, he was a hand writer. Uh, similarly, he's taking a photograph and making an abstraction out of it. And then in the 1950s, he is called upon to uh, do something he had never really done before, and that was transform the graphic look of a corporation, IBM. And he created a uh, an revised or refreshed logo for it. They were using Stymie Bold, he used City Bold, and started slowly but surely recreating their entire visual image until he got to this uh, Scanline IBM logo, which uh, represents a lot of things to a lot of different people. But to him, it represented contrast. And he'd play around a lot. Uh, I have dozens, in fact, hundreds of his sketches. He was always drawing. And one thing I tell students all the time is doodle. Doodle, 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 because that's how you think. Uh, he created the Westinghouse brand using Westinghouse's uh, iconic W and a bar underneath the W. And in his Rand's case, he made the W the bar into a lozenge and he made the W into what could be interpreted as a schematic uh, electrical drawing, but many people thought of it as a crown for a king. And he would disassemble his own work to help designers in the companies in specially created design academies to learn how to design using the systems better. So my book, after he passed away, I wrote the obit on him in the New York Times and 
that led to the book Paul Rand. And a couple of years ago, I did this book for uh, Molskin and P Princeton Architectural Press, which is a collection of all of many of his sketches. And they go from being well thought out to just doodles, but it really shows his process. Another biography I did, this one in conjunction with this man's white widow. Uh, this is Alvin Lustig, and I worked with Elaine Lustig Cohen on the book because she had all of Alvin Lustig's materials. He was well known as a book jacket designer using abstract art as the basis of his book jackets, uh, using iconography uh, that has a childlike quality to it, but is really quite sophisticated. And then when he got tired of doing the same things, he'd try something else. This is actually a photograph of a blackboard on which he puts uh, metal type. Uh, he had a number of different approaches, but they always turned out to be lustigs, uh, which means he worked in ambient styles, but he injected his own personality. Uh, this is an early issue of Industrial Design Magazine, which he designed the first two issues of. Uh, it's quite a beautiful cover uh, and has both practical and symbolic significance. And this is a cover that he did for Fortune, which is one of the most beautiful magazine covers ever uh, without cover lines. He did more than graphic design. He did industrial design, even though he wasn't trained as such. He uh, designed this uh, two-seater helicopter for Rotoron. Um, I wouldn't ride in it, but it did work. And it looked very much like his uh, Paramount chairs. Um, so one thing always led to another in inspirationally. Uh, this was an office that he designed at Look Magazine. It was his uh, design group, which was an experimental design group that was funded by uh, the magazine and the company Look. Uh, the photogram on the wall belonged to uh, Gorgi Kepish. But what was interesting about this is that he designed all the furniture. And he designed the furniture to be transparent. So you see these cubby holes are hanging or held up uh, off the desk. So there was desk space. And at the same time, people could see who they were talking to in the office. And that became a book called Born Modern, The Life and Work of Alvin Lustig, which was designed by uh, Elaine Lustig Cohen's daughter, Tamar. Uh, I did a lot of work in uncovering the work of uh, Alex Steinweiss, who was the first person to introduce record album covers in the United States. Now, there were record albums, and they were called albums because, in fact, they looked like albums. They were for 78 RPMs. Uh, so there were maybe in any given album, there were four or five discs that were in craft paper coverings. And they stood on a shelf in a hardware store or a music shop. Uh, there were no such things as record stores. And they were spine out. So Alex Steinweiss, who was pretty young at the time, said, I bet you I can increase sales by putting an original piece of art on the front of an album and let it sit front out instead of spine out. And that's what he did. And the first album he did, the sales increased by 800%. Uh, Steinweiss gave up doing all of this when he was around 50 because that's when rock and roll started happening and his work was anything but rock and roll. It was jazz, it was folk, it was popular. Um, this is one of his covers. This is another for marches, 
he, he was influenced by the French poster artists. So there's a lot of poster looking uh, work here, as well as smidgens, if not more than smidgens of abstraction. And this was the book that came out of that, uh, which Tashin published in three different sizes. This, I think, was the big size. It was huge uh, and a beautiful uh, testament to the man's work. Fortunately, it was done while he was still alive. And speaking of jazz, uh, that's what modernism seems to be about to a great degree. Uh, modernism is a way of thinking. It's a spirit. It's an essence. Uh, it is translated in many different visual forms. Uh, it was primarily European, uh, but it was also considered a universal language. And um, I was very, uh, uh, how shall I put it, anti-modernist for many years as I was growing up. I thought it was very uh, uh, um, uninclusive. It was uh, a very corporate, cold sensibility. And what I was really thinking of was the coldest part of modernism. There's a whole range of modernist practice, and a lot of it is warm and inclusive. Uh, Command Records was one of the big exemplars of using uh, modern design in their record covers. So this is symbolic of trumpet trombone playing. Uh, Charles E. Murphy was one of the uh, many designers who worked for Command Records. Uh, Modernism also incorporated classicism. Uh, so classic images were used and modern devices were used as well. Uh, George Giusti, who did this cover, uh, shows that modernism can be very personal, very expressive drawing in this Albert Camus book. And Walter Allner, uh, created modernist covers for Fortune magazine in the uh, early 50s using geometry as his fundamental formal language. And that became the book called The Moderns that I did with Greg D'Onofrio. And these are just some pages from that book. This is Joseph Albers and one of his command records. Uh, it really does illustrate that title, Provocative Percussion. This is George Giusti, who you just saw, <clears throat> his interiors magazine, making use of collage. Lester Beale was uh, one of America's most important um, interpreters of European design in the US. Robert Brownjohn, who later became Brownjohn Shemaya from Geismar, uh, was also key, a key player. Sadly, he uh, died of a heroin overdose in London where he went to work after leaving his partnership. And the book is basically dedicated to a man named Rudo Udeharik, who was an American designer, grew up in California, who used the strictures of modernism, the same typefaces and the same sizes. There were no hierarchical sizes, uh, but he used geometry and other abstract forms to convey the message. So you look at these things and I used to look at these things and think they were boring, but something happened in my synapses and I started realizing not how clever they were, not how smart they were, but how effective they were, how they tickled my eyeballs. And Lillian Baseman uh, is one of six women in the book. Uh, women were not 
given their due in the 1940s, although there were a number of them working in the design fields. Uh, she took on Junior Bazaar, which was executive art directed by Alexei Brodovich, who didn't want her to have credit as art director in the magazine. And she put it in anyway and said, tough noogies. And uh, she made quite a, a splash for herself in the magazine field and then switched over to photography and became a highly reputable photographer. Another of my fascinations, I wouldn't call it passion, but certainly fascination, is how symbols work in our culture and how different symbols mean different things to different people. And one of the symbols that most impacted me as a kid and later as an adult was the swastika and still is. So I started looking for swastika lore, uh, swastika history and found that it had a super long history going back perhaps to prehistory uh, where it was used as a good luck charm, uh, where it, it, swastika is a word that comes from Sanskrit for, for good luck. Uh, it was used commercially by many companies before the Nazis took it over. The Nazis taking it over, uh, there is argument and debate these days that it's not even the swastika, that it's the hooked cross or the hacking cruise of uh, Hitler's sick imagination but it's, uh, the form is basically the same. Uh, but what would be called backwards or forwards, the swastika was used in many different contexts. This was the Corn Palace in South Dakota, where it was used as a good luck charm with all those arabesques. And this was used by the girls club as their highest award. And they published a magazine called the swastika. And then it comes all the way back to the, what does the swastika mean to those who have to endure it and suffer from it and relate to it in negative terms. And we come back to the swastika being used in awkward ways. This is a restaurant in Thailand, which is called Hitler's Cross. For what reason, I know not. And this is a using the swastika as a kind of negative for, against cigarettes. It's an anti-smoking cigarette symbol, but the argument is whether it works or not. So I did a book called The Swastika Symbol Beyond Redemption, which Hank used in a number of his classes, uh, his 5.30 in the morning classes, which I was once young enough to do. Uh, and then I did, two follow-up books. One, The Swastika Symbols of Hate, and that happened after the uh, Trump became president and we started seeing an outburst of hate crimes and other nativist uh, experiences. Uh, so that's the one that's out now. And there was a one in between, a revision in between of swastika. And I also am fascinated by how branding, uh, which is such a common term and has become so much a part of our design uh, industry, has been used so effectively for totalitarian regimes. Basically, it's about making trade characters. So Hitler as Mr. Clean, uh, Mao, Mussolini, basically, even though one is comic and commercial, the other is using the same methods of commerciality to sell an ideology. I'm fascinated by how children were sucked into the fascist and totalitarian vortex. And uh, this is just one example of a child's toy that was sold 
in fascist Italy. And this was a handbook for uh, the girls group. Uh, women didn't have a lot of rights in fascist Italy and girls were basically bred to take care of the men. And this is their handbook. This is the uh, young uh, Nazi youth in Austria before and after the Anschluss. And this is the little red book of Mao's China, which was the Bible of the Red Guard, which were made up primarily of teenagers. And this was a young pioneer in the Soviet Union. Uh, in the United States, the camps would be called red diaper baby camps. And I do this all because it's coming back and we see it more and more. We're in very treacherous times. Uh, we see right-wing populism growing in this country and in others. And countries that were homes to democracy are now using symbols that relate back to the Nazi period and use the gestures that rate return to the Nazi period or the communist period. And there's still vandalism uh, using the swastika. So when people tell me, give, give it a break, forget the swastika, it's gonna go away. I'm reminded that it doesn't go away. I'm gonna show you now just a bunch of books that I've done uh, that I'm proud of. Uh, Rants and Raves is basically my attack on uh, different aspects of popular culture that need to be called out for one reason or another. Uh, this was a cover by George Lois. It's the only cover that he did that never got published in Esquire. And this is a book by Upton Sinclair, who was a great progressive writer. Uh, and it was about race and racial relations in the 20s and 30s. This is my book, Graphic Style. This is the third of four, four editions that Hank tells me he uses. This is a book that I did with Veronique Vienne, uh, 100 Ideas That Changed Graphic Design. And each one is a little mini history of aspects of tropes, conceits of design. And right before the pandemic, this book on teaching design history came out. And I must say it's kind of gotten uh, stale since the pandemic because so much now has been done on African-American design history, which has been ignored for so long. And other nativist or native histories. Uh, Icons of Graphic Design is a book that Mirko Illich and I did together, which basically shows examples of where design comes from. We also did one called Anatomy of Graphic Design. And it shows that graphic design doesn't just come from the earth fully formed. It has to borrow, it has to adapt, and it has to be influenced by many different forms. Stylepedia is a book that Louise and I did. It's a collection of essays on different quirks and mannerisms of design. Mirko and I did this book on lettering large, which is basically lettering in the environment and used in architecture, used as architecture. Uh, used as decoration in, on a large scale. And just for cheap thrills, uh, I did a couple of type books or type products that could be used for one's enjoyment, like this typographic gift, gift wrapping. And this one I'm very happy with, although it didn't get much distribution. This is called Type Deck. 
and it's a series of flashcards that give you the history of typography uh, from the early Victorian period to the present. With Lita Tellerico, who I co-chair uh, the MFA program here, we've done a few books together and we've done books on sketchbooks. There's nothing I love more than to look at somebody's sketchbook and see how they think. Uh, and we did two books, one called, uh, I can't remember what the one was called, Typographic Sketchbooks, and this one, hand, uh, Freehand New Typography Sketchbooks. Uh, anytime I'm invited to work on a project that has something to do with old lettering, I'm, I'm there in a second. And this was Esther Smith's book uh, on the chromatic type done by the uh, William Page Company. And this is a book I did with Gail Anderson. Gail and I have done about 15 books together. And this was part of a series on uh, custom type. Uh, this is new ornamental type. We did new vintage type and we did new modern type. And this year we came out with ex uh, expressive type. I forget what the name of the book is, but uh, it's a nice one. Uh, this is another book I did where I kind of take apart different people's uh, work and show the user how to not recreate the exact piece, but how to use some of the techniques. Mirko and I did a book on for Shakespeare's 300th anniversary, or what we think it was, of all the posters that we could find that were beautiful, that were done uh, with Shakespeare as their focus. And this is a book that's become very obsolete that I did with Veronique Vienne called Becoming a Graphic Designer. And this one's called Becoming a Graphic and Digital Designer. This book was one of my biggest selling books in its first three editions. Um, and then design just changed and has changed. Uh, I did a fun book on how failure makes design uh, viable, uh, how we learn from failure. And James Victory did this cover to uh, underscore the idea of failure. And this is another book of my essays how popular culture is shaped by graphic design. I've done two editions with Veronique Vienne of uh, Citizen Designer about social responsibility. And I've done two editions of Teaching Graphic Design. Uh, this is the second. And I've done uh, three editions of The Education of a Graphic Designer, which invited uh, 50 different design educators, both professional design educators and part-time educators who are practicing design to offer their uh, philosophies and interests in the practice of design teaching. Uh, the teaching graphic design book was all um, syllabi. And because I believe writing and research are key to the new designer and the old designer. Um, and because I co-founded the writing program at the School of Visual Arts for Design, I did a book on writing and research. And with Seymour Quast, who I've done maybe 20 books with, uh, we did an illustration history I have to say, though, it's not one of my favorite books, but I do love the cover. And most recently, this just came out this past month, uh, Seymour had the idea of uh, doing a book where we describe all the ways hell is perceived throughout the world. So we have 86 different hells in here. Uh, and it turned out to be one of my favorite projects. 
And I'm going to end on the cover for the book that uh, Hank mentioned. It's a memoir of 10 years of my life in New York, uh, working on underground newspapers, working for underground papers, um, doing activism where I could, meeting people who have become cultural icons and talking about difficulties of growing up. So it's a kind of coming of age book. And as Hank said, I'm co-chair of MFA Design. We're about to enter our 25th year and uh, we're all back in school. It's been a wonderful experience to be back, even though we're all wearing masks and distancing. Uh, but the year of living safely was not my happiest year. And these are people I want to thank for collaboration over the years. And this, by the way, is what that room turned into. Uh, we had to leave the townhouse that we were in. So that entire apartment got stripped down. Half of the materials were given to libraries and sold. And the other half, I don't know how I fit it in our new apartment, but it's there. I just can't get to anything. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be one of the admissions advisors helping you guys to start your creative careers here with the Miami Ad School with our four portfolio programs, art direction, copywriting, photography and video and design, as well as our boot camps. We are well equipped to make you well equipped for the creative industry. And my job is to help you transition smoothly from prospective to enrolled student. We have financial aid and scholarships available for all of our portfolio programs and our four U.S. locations, Miami, Atlanta, San Francisco, and New York, as well as our international locations are ready for you guys to go ahead and enroll when you are ready. So feel free to go to our website, www.miamiadschool.com, hit apply now, start your application, and if you have any questions, set up a call, and we will be happy to help you.